Good morning. I'm, my name is Chris Emmel and I'm a neighbour of Simon Vegro who's taking a well-earned break this week. This week both Ivan Hickmott and myself will be hosting this and we hope we'll live up to Simon's usual very, very high standard. The, um, the call is, and you've got to believe it, it's going global and you can watch it on, on, uh, on, on, on your screen or phone in. Uh, if you want to remain anonymous, you can change your name and we are, <coughs> let me just tell you, if you haven't guessed it already, we are not the BBC, so bear with us. There is, however, a chat function uh, that you may wish to use. And afterwards, um, everybody's on mute, by the way, so you can make as much noise as you like uh, when, when we're, uh, we're, we're doing this. And um, these, these calls are going, going out afterwards on Facebook Live, and also it'll also be on the Active in Redbourne website too. Now, as usual, I need to check with Olive whether I've forgotten anything. Olive, That's have fine. I forgotten anything? That's fine, Chris. That's a surprise to me too. Good morning, Liz. Morning, Chris. How are and you? How are you today? I'm very well, thank you. Very well. So what news for the surgery? Okay, so um, a quick update about uh, some vaccine um, things. Um, the majority of the COVID cases that are currently in the population and in our area are of the new Indian variant, um, which is called Delta. I'm not sure if any of you are aware of that. Um, it is spreading quite quickly um, and the numbers are, are doubling. Um, it does seem to be affecting the younger population the most um, and the number of cases doesn't seem to be correlating with the same number of hospital admissions as previous variants have been which is good news um, so uh, so the people that are ending up in hospital um, tend to be because they've not had a vaccine or that they've only had one vaccine um, it's affecting the younger population more um, because those are the people that haven't had a vaccine yet. Um, so whilst it's concerning that these cases are rising, it is good news that the vaccine does seem to be holding its own against this Delta variant. Um, so having two vaccines does provide um, protection against it. It's about 30% after one vaccine, and then that shoots up, up to about 80% after the second vaccine. Um, and then obviously you have to wait for two to three weeks after that second vaccine. Um, therefore, it's really, really important that people have their second vaccine and to help that we have brought the second vaccine program forward to eight weeks rather than 12 weeks so people may well get an invitation to have their second vaccine earlier than they were anticipating it um, so please please do um, respond to those invitations to get your second vaccine because that does give that extra protection against this variant which is the variant of concern at the moment um, also, we're now down to age 25 um, at, of, the, of the younger generation that are being um, invited for their first vaccine. Um, so we're trying to move at pace with that as well, uh, supply depending. Um, therefore, sort of, I was speaking to the doctors yesterday, and um, we obviously don't know this yet, but we are expecting that there probably will be a pause on the 21st of June reopening um, of everything to be to allow the vaccine campaign to catch up a little bit so obviously we don't know that as Chris says we're not the BBC I don't know but um, we wouldn't be surprised if if that is um, what's coming um, because we just need to get more people under our wing and vaccinated um, to, for, to be able to remain safe um, so basically message from us is please go for your second. And if you're young and um, you've been invited for your first, then please, please go for that as well, um, which is uh, really, really important. Just some stat. I thought you might be interested in some statistics about Watford Hospital at the moment. I don't have any about L Luton and Dunstable um, or the Lister Hospital, but about Watford um, and sort of, the, uh, sort of what's going on in the West Hearts um, Trust. Um, Infection rates have increased by about 32%, um, and that's about 28.4 uh, cases per 100,000 patients um, in our area. 
Um, in the 60 plus age group, it's increased by 15.4%. So you can see that it is much more in the younger age groups um, than the older generation because they've had their vaccine. Um, the 2 to 16 year old age group is the highest, is where the highest numbers are um, of, of infection rate at the moment. There's four COVID positive people in West Hearts Hospital Trust at the moment and one in ITU. So the low, the numbers in the hospitals are still very low. Um, so they haven't got any beds closed at the moment and no beds are empty due to COVID. So, um, so the hospital is still looking in good shape at the moment, which we're, we're pleased about because they ain't half got a good big backlog to get through. Um, and we are, um, we are experiencing a lot of, um, frustrated, upset, completely understandably uh, patients because referrals and um, uh, pathways have been so delayed and uh, appointments have been cancelled as they're prioritising and things like that. So um, so the longer that we can keep those COVID cases less in the hospitals, the better for everybody else's other care, if you like, because things should be able to get back to a little bit of normal normality. Um, just some other news. Um, uh, I was um, sort of in the reception area at Redbourne a, a couple of days ago, and I just overheard quite a lot of phone calls coming through where people were um, requesting repeat prescriptions over the telephone. Um, and this isn't something that we are able to do because um, if we're if we time has shown that if we do that, the mistakes that are made is, can be really quite dangerous because the receptionists aren't medically trained and for taking something over the telephone, they may take it down wrong. So we do need patients to um, put in a repeat prescription request form on paper or email, either to us or to the pharmacy. So please don't phone in with um, to ask me to, to order repeat medication. Um, and just to, um, just so that everybody's aware, we have got a long overdue training afternoon on the 13th of July. So um, the surgery will be closed on the, in the afternoon of the 13th of July. Um, so anybody that needs emergency care will be um, our heart surgeon care are covering us. So um, patients will be advised to dial 111 um, and the um, heart, as we call it, will be dealing with people with our patients for that afternoon so just so everybody's aware of that and that's all i had chris unless you've got any questions uh, i'm not going to ask you any, i mean that was a fully comprehensive and wide-ranging i have to say going going back to the specific about the vaccinations my understanding is that if you're above 25 um and you get an invite get down there and fill your boots i think that's the brief yeah yeah is there any way that someone can turn up for a, a vaccination if they've not been invited or, or find some way of actually getting a vaccination if they didn't have one um without being unhelpful if they're not if they haven't been invited yet so yeah. if they're 18 to 25 yes yeah, so I, I went to one recently and, and basically there are other people there who are just able just to walk in and uh, that, that yeah you are able to walk in at, i think you can walk in at the Alban arena but you still have to be within that age cohort that has been invited so you might not have booked an appointment but you could walk in, but you still have to be over 25. So over 25, Auburn Arena, you can, you can walk in and get your you vaccination. You can walk in or take a little or bit of pressure on other people. Um, yeah, way. yeah. Or you can wait for your, um, or you can respond to your Batchwood invitation and go there. Excellent. That's good news. Well, thank you very much. And I hope you no, enjoy the rest enjoy. of your lovely sunny day. Yes, exactly. Enjoy. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Cheers then. Talking of sunny days, we've got Sunny Will next, back from his holidays and fresh as a daisy, I hope. Good morning, Will. Good morning, Chris. Uh, I don't know about fresh as a daisy, but I had a lovely time. I, I, I miss being with you for a couple of weeks, so uh, nice to be back. <laughs> You're a Vicky. You're not allowed to tell lies. <laughs> I don't tell lies. I'm teasing you. <laughs> very, very good. Okay, well, over, over to you, Will. Lovely. Well, um, I think it takes a special kind of incompetence and the English propensity for a cock up for the national cricket team up against the second highest ranked test side in the world currently. 
and playing at the glorious home of cricket, Lords, to line up in specially printed T-shirts displaying anti-discrimination slogans, and minutes later to give a debut to a promising young cricketer who takes seven wickets and scores 42 much needed runs, only to end the match in disgrace with him suspended for his historic posts on social media. Who didn't do the due diligence here? And apparently there's another English cricketer as yet unnamed, who's also alleged to have expressed similarly vile and unpalatable views at the age of 16. So we can expect uh, an announcement today or tomorrow and a second suspension. And maybe there are others as well, leaving all plans for selecting the team for a game which starts tomorrow severely compromised and any chance of focusing properly and preparing well for the demanding task in hand utterly decimated. I'm actually going to Edgbaston to watch the first day of that second test tomorrow. And at this rate, I may be watching the second 11 be, uh, play. <laughs> but let's keep some focus here on what really matters. There are more uh, important considerations than the bruised prospects of a cricketer at the start of his international career, no matter how promising. As a die-hard fan, there are some things that are more important, much more important, even than cricket. This is about what is acceptable and what is not, about attitudes, diversity and inclusion, and about our society that for too long has been myopic <coughs> about how others in our country are being treated, viewed and referred to. This isn't just about a cricketer who thinks it's clever to let his fingers do the trash talking in his teens. It's about a whole host of issues. The Black Lives Matter movement, the slave trade memorials, a lack of diversity in film and television, equal pay, white privilege, and about Harvey Weinstein and his ilk. This is all part of a whole and has been bubbling for a while. And until something is actually done, then all the rhetoric in the world and no amount of catchy slogan and knee taking is going to make the slightest bit of difference. About Ollie Robinson, the cricketer in question, some have said, well, it was a long while ago. He was 18 or 19 at the time, immature and at a bad moment in his life. Leave him be. He's 27 now and appears to be genuinely remorseful and devastated about this situation. But it is a situation of his making. He is not the victim here. It's a salutary reminder that if you email something, you post something, you tweet something, then it is in the public domain forever. Our digital footprint is there forever. And if he didn't know it, he, that he was in enough trouble already, he soon did. You know you've got it badly wrong when Oliver Dowden and Boris Johnson come to your aid and speak up for you. And that isn't a party political swipe, but they're pleased that the ECB suspension is over the top, demonstrates all too clearly the blinkered views that come out of white privilege and a lack of understanding about how being on the end of such abhorrent views about people of different colour, culture or gender really feels like. For the hard of hearing, privilege in this context does not equate to wealth and fame, but the mere fact of being free to go about your daily life without the hindrance or obstruction as a consequence of skin colour. Don't for goodness sake let anyone brush this off as old banter. And let's not be squeamish about this either. Robinson's diatribe about Muslims and people of colour are echoed, for example, in the behaviour of balding white men who post Twitter videos of themselves booing the symbolic gesture of English footballers taking the knee. This would no doubt be the same constituency that argue that white lives matter just as much as black lives, as if people of colour are not already painfully aware of the value placed upon whiteness in this world. This is why it matters what Ollie Robinson um, answers and um, that he does answer for the views expressed in 2012. He might have been a teenager, 
but he was at the time old enough to cast a vote in the election of a member of parliament. I imagine the dressing room at Lord's was a pretty uncomfortable place at the weekend. It would have been an even more uncomfortable place if Moen Ali or Joffre Archer had been in the side. But as if to ram the point home, it did look a very white privileged team that walked through the long room past the adoring ex-public school boys and out onto the pitch. Look, I'm a Christian and I believe very firmly in the power and importance of forgiveness. You don't brush off sin, you take it seriously. You acknowledge it, you confess it, and you seek forgiveness for it by learning from it and demonstrating true contrition and you try not to do it again. I hope that Ollie Robinson can access some help, some training and education, and then come back into the England fold in due course. Joe Root, the England captain, handled it well. It's a lesson to everyone in the game, he said. More has to be done. That continued education and learning about how to behave in society and within our sport. We've started doing a lot of good work as a team. We want to make the game as inclusive and diverse as we possibly can. And we'll continue to keep looking at finding ways to make that possible. Ollie Robinson incident and the continued booing of footballers who take the knee suggests that racism and the fight against prejudice will very sadly remain a feature of the sporting landscape across the summer months, I'm afraid. Strides have been made in the past year since the death of George Floyd and the conviction of a police officer for his murder. This then is a time for vigilance, for examining our conscience and for thinking through the consequences of our actions, lest we drift back to the old ways. And as Joe Root tells us, there is much still to be done. Thank you, Will. Um, I would say that was one of your more hard hitting um, <laughs> talks for us. I completely agree with every word that you said, as I suspect, as you probably know. And I sometimes think we underestimate the value of silence in the sense that I'm just going to pause for a few seconds before we move on to process my own thoughts about what you're saying. I'm a great lover of cricket. I'm a great lover of sport. And um, I've, the words human decency and doing the right thing come to mind as I was listening to you. So I'm just, I'm just going to pause for just a few seconds and then we'll move on to the next item. But as always, thank you for sharing those thoughts. My pleasure. Apparently, the, the, the Finns as a race are particularly adept at, culturally at dealing with silence. And I, I always think after about 10 seconds, the, the urge to say something bubbles up. So I'm going to move on. And I'd like to welcome a guest from over the hill in, who's in Berkhamstead, Kimberly, Kim Rodwell. Morning, Kim. Morning. I hope you're getting a flavour for our community news by which oh, yeah which moves around. Um, Kim is joining us and Kim works for Thames Water. She's one of the team that looks after Redbourne and there's quite a lot going on in Redbourne at the minute in regard to, to, to our water supply. And I've got a couple of questions that I'd like to put to Kim um, to help us understand um, a little bit more. And it struck me as I was thinking about this morning that the provision of clean water is a key part of community life, but it's something that we all, kind, me included, so often just take for granted. Um, and I also realise that, I know it's in my case it's true, and I suspect for others, that who looks after our water is not well understood. So the first thing I'd like to ask of you, Kim, is can you help us Redborners to just to understand who the various key providers are, you know, how does what Affinity Water do relate to Thames Water, to the Environment Agency? And obviously one of the higher profile local groups is the Vare Valley Society. So just, just help us understand who does what 
for a moment or two before we ask a couple of other questions. Yeah, absolutely. So firstly, thank you so much for inviting me today. It's an Pleasure. absolute honour to be here. So in this area, as with Summer London, um, your clean water is provided by Affinity Water. So they are a completely separate company to Thames Water. So Affinity supply your clean drinking water. Thames Water are responsible for taking your dirty water away. That means that we're responsible for the sewers in the area. So you only pay one bill, so you pay Affinity Water, but on your bill there'll be a breakdown um, detailing the proportion that goes to Thames Water. They handle all that for you, so you just pay one bill. Um, the Environment Agency are our regulator. They regulate the entire water industry on our environmental performance and commitments. Um, and the Ver Valley Society are a stakeholder group who work alongside um, other key stakeholders, so the council, um, the Environment Agency, Affinity Water, Thames Water, to do um, improvement projects on, on the river. Wonderful. That's very clear. I hope I can remember that, but for the first time, I now understand. What are the, what are the, what are, what are the sorts of major challenges that your part of this, the, the action is looking at in terms of uh, Thames Water? You know, what are the major things that you're having to think about and deal with for, for a place like Redbourne? Yeah, absolutely. So you'll probably have seen our tankers around um, in the area. Um, and this is because at the moment, our sewers are much um, fuller than they usually are. Um, this is because we've had a really um, wet winter, so a lot of heavy rainfall, and the groundwater table in this area is quite high at the moment. So some of this extra water is entering our sewer network. We're working really, really hard to identify how exactly it's getting into our network. Um, if you're wondering why perhaps we've not done this sooner, it's because we've had to wait for the levels to drop slightly um, in order for us to use our camera equipment. Oh, so wow. if the sewers are full, um, it's really hard for us to pinpoint exactly where it's infiltrating our network because we just can't see it. So we've waited until the levels have dropped so that we can see the exact points of infiltration. Uh, we've already made really good progress on this recently, identifying two key areas where excess water is coming into our network. So one is just off Harpenden Lane, and the second is at the top of Hemel Hempstead Road. So these are the areas that we're immediately focusing on. So I was out um, yesterday on Hemel Hempstead Road, and we've got crews currently working as we speak on the Harpenden Lane side. So once we know exactly how the excess water is coming into our network, we can put a more permanent solution in place. So this might entail some work to reline our sewers, so putting um, an impermeable membrane in the existing pipe to stop any of that excess water coming in. It could be work to cap off lines, maybe some old lines are there that aren't used anymore and we can just cap them off, or even some major engineering fixes. Um, unfortunately, it's all a little unknown until we've done the investigative work and we know what we're dealing with. Um, cases like this are really complex, so they might take us a few weeks to put right um, and it's really hard for me to give you a time scale because of that. But please be rest assured that our engineers are working really hard um, to find these locations and, and do it as quickly as they can. Um, the tankering that we've got in the town. So we're currently tankering from three different locations. Um, this is to lower the levels in those sewers, um, reducing the risk of them flooding and then causing any pollution to land or, or to the river. So our tanker drivers are also monitoring for any blockages that might be causing the situation to be a little bit worse. So we know that our tankers can be noisy and they can disrupt local traffic. And we're really, really sorry if you've been affected by this. So, so the one on the, the tanker I've seen on the high street, um, the south end of the high street would be an yeah. example of tankering as you describe it. Yeah, so that's one location. So for that specific location, they're visiting it three times a day um, and they're taking a full tanker, if not two or three loads. So quite huge volumes of water from the network. That's just to alleviate some of the pressure on the network to allow residents to continue using their facilities as normal. Um, so we have to do that, unfortunately, until the, until we've um, identified where the issues are and we've done the remedial work. To, to fix those issues so you'll continue to see us um for a while longer with the tankering until the fixes are done on the network that's really interesting so if i just play back what i think i'm hearing the identification of the problem is complicated and takes quite a while yes and then once you've figured out what the problem is to actually do the rectification and fix also takes a while but by definition 
because you're talking about substantive infrastructure. Yeah, essentially. Um, I know from the work that we did yesterday that we're going to be looking to reline a section of sewer. So it's just about um, having those conversations with our contractors and getting this planned in as soon as we can. We'll have to work with other stakeholders in the area, such as the council um, and local residents, because there might be um, road closures needed for us to do the work to you know, keep our, our engineers safe when they're doing that. But um, what I'll do is I'll aim to provide as much updates as possible, either on this platform or um, via a newsletter, just to keep you updated as to what work we're doing and the timescales and any impact it might have on local residents as well. Splendid. And thank you for saying that. That's an important part of the yeah. part of the equation. Lovely. Kim, thank you so much for that update. That's really helpful. Um, we'll keep we'll keep watching as as events unfold. Absolutely. Um, and if you see any of our engineers or myself out and about, feel free to, to approach us. We're all a friendly bunch and, and we'll be happy to explain the work that we're doing. Um, also, if you've been affected by any issues, so maybe slow draining facilities, the number to call is our, our customer number, um, which I've not got in front of me, but I'll make sure that you've got it so you can distribute it. Um, and that would be the number to call. But yeah, absolutely. Put, I'm really put it, the, put it on. If you send a chat with a number on there, that we can we can circulate that for you. Perfect. Yeah, I'll do that shortly. So yeah, we're really committed to resolving the issue. And thank you so much for bearing with us. Not at all. Thank you. Okay, let's 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 move on. Good morning, Sally. Oh, good morning, Ivan. How are you? I'm very well today on this be beautiful hot Redbourne day. Um, so there have been some developments in and around the Redbourne Community Group, I know. Um, so as one of our regular guests, when we talked earlier in the week, we thought it would be well worthwhile just uh, giving you a chance to share with us the thinking behind the change of name, but also talk a little bit about what the implications of the change of name might be in the short to medium term, but also longer term. But um, just to get us started, Sally, We've, I've read that the care group is changing its name to the community group. What's the background to this? And, and I guess one of the questions Redbourneers will be thinking about is, hmm, does this mean they're going to stop doing things or are you going to continue what you've been doing so wonderfully well for so many years in the village? So big question. I'll let you answer it. That's a lot of questions, Ivan. Um, I'll first of all say thank you very much for inviting me back. I had a look to see when I was last on here, and it was in March, actually. Time has flown. Oh, and wow. that was when we were saying thank you to the three trustees who stepped down, you know, Barry, Peter, and um, Steve. So thank you for asking me to come back. Um, where do I start, really? I think I would start with saying that changing the name, it's not a new idea. Um, I've been involved with the care group now for about six years, actually, and I remember um, many discussions at that time about changing the name. And I think we had the new minibus, I'll call it new, it's not really new, it was 2018, I think. And there were discussions then about calling it the community bus. Um, we didn't actually take that step at that point. I think what triggered it really was we were very fortunate um, a couple of years ago to be invited to be part of a, um, a program that Will Hobhouse, the then sheriff, which I know some people have, have met, um, he invited us on a, on a program called Building Effectiveness. And part of that was to develop a five-year plan. Um, that was quite a challenge, actually. But we were very fortunate because we had some excellent mentors and some excellent um, advisors. One of the things that came out of that, there were many things actually, but one of the things was about um, marketing and perception within the village and, and outside it. Right. And because obviously, you know, <clears throat> for a charity to be sustainable, you need to A, attract volunteers and, and obviously funding i mean there's lots of other bits but those are the two core elements if you haven't got volunteers and you haven't got funding then you're a bit a, a bit stuck um so that was part of of what we were doing as part of the five-year plan and looking at this we we kept thinking that the perception both within the village and outside of it was that rcg the care group really whatever however we tried um was perceived as a charity for elderly people in the village. 
Um, there are examples of this because I know when I answered the phone in the office, people from inside the village who've lived here for years phone up and, and think you're a care agency. I remember one call not so long ago when somebody said, you know, my mother, she can't be left on her own at night anymore. Can you organize a rotor of volunteers to sit with her through the night? Blimey. Somebody, you know, other people have rung up and said, you know, we need personal care for my, my uncle or my father. Um, can you organize that? So the perception within the village, um, we were struggling to change. And I think it stems back, I think we decided that it stems back to um, the word care, because obviously language changes, it evolves. And 40 years ago, there's no doubt that it was an excellent choice of the word, Redbond Care Group. But nowadays, it means something very different. Well, not very different, but slightly different in that it means carers and caring and care homes. So I think we thought we had to sort of take the bull by the horns really and, and make a move because it's so important to make sure that the village knows that it is for the whole community, it's for everybody. So for the AGM um, last October, we asked members to um, vote and we had an overwhelming um, sort of vote, 92% of people voting wanted to change to community groups. So that sort of gave us the green light then. So, um, you know, off, off, we've, off we've gone, really. I can't remember your next question. Well, then, I guess but you are, I think I'm right in saying you are, you are going to carry on doing the things you built a reputation of for over the years, and it's just worth calling that out. I've, I, absolutely worth calling it out. The, um, I, I mean, we are now called the community group. The bureaucracy and the changes have gone through and um, that's required a huge amount of patience. Our treasurer is very patient fortunately but I think it's tested him to the limit. Changing bank accounts and community um, commission websites and things is, has been very testing mm -hmm. but we are now officially the community group. Um, in some ways it's changing things and in other ways it isn't. Um, hopefully by the end of the week most of you will have had a leaflet through the door which is introducing Redbourne Community Group and you will see a range of services in there. Um, we've also relaunched the website so there's a new, a new website and we were fortunate again last week because we were invited to be part of a video clip that Team Hearts were putting together to celebrate Volunteers Week. And those of you who've looked at that video, and I would recommend that you do, um, the, the, the minibus and two of our volunteers are doing some shopping on that. So many of the services are the same. Because of the pandemic last year, we have extended and we've adapted things. Um, so we're doing prescription deliveries, we're doing shopping. A big thing is the friendly talkers and the friendly walkers and that service is very popular in fact we're quite short of friendly talkers so anybody listening who's good at listening or who's good at talking if you'd like to volunteer to, to call somebody um, on a regular basis we'd be very glad to hear from you um, and the newsletters of course not um, we're thinking about extending those perhaps once a month um, as time goes on but we're discussing that at the moment the, the key um, element of, or one of the key elements that for us is to get the outings up and running again. Obviously, we're waiting for the announcements next week and we're quite cautious, but it's been such a thrill. It's been so uplifting this week to have coffee off the common and coffee on the common back. Yeah, yeah. On Thursday, it was wonderful on Thursday when the minibus brought people. I mean, they were, you know, it was such a thrill. It just makes you sort of realise how important it is for people to get out and about and how what we considered before as a, a, a mundane thing is so important. So, so those will be carrying on. And as the restrictions lift, then more afternoon outings, perhaps we'll, we'll organise those. But I have to say we've been a little bit cautious on that front. But, but those are the plans that we've got for the immediate future, really. And it's, it, 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 I kind of hear it as, as 
you want to establish on a more permanent basis many of the responses that you've made to, to the COVID scenario over the last year to make them more of a permanent part of the offering? Ab absolutely. Um, I can't see anything stopping. In, in fact, I think we're going to enhance and increase what we do as, as if, you know, as and if we've got the resources to do that. And sort of thinking, I think you asked me about longer term plans, you know, what about five years ahead? Yeah, what, very, what are your dreams for the future? Well, I know what my dream is, but it's probably <laughs> um, <laughs> not, not relevant to this. Um, but for five years, I would like to think, I think we would all like to think that the charity is sustainable. And that's what we've been working towards, that it is robust. It can adapt like we did last year to the pandemic. And the, we don't know what external forces are coming forward. I mean, housing developments, for instance, have been put on hold. So, you know, there are going to be external factors that we need to look at. And in that case, we really do want the charity to be robust, to be adaptable and work in partnership and collaboration with others in the community. We, we need to, you know, continue to make Redbourne a, a lovely place to live. Having said that, one of the key things is we don't want to forget the past. We don't want to forget that wonderful legacy that those founders um, created years ago. Um, and so what we're looking at now is setting up something that we're going to call the Harebell Club. Um, and if you might like to invite me on in the future week before you finish, then hopefully I'll be able to give you some more exciting news about the Harebell Club and what we're going to do with that, because that's going to be a mixture of hopefully things to look I've just for. written it down, Sally. Harebell, Harebell okay. Club, as it sounds, I presume. Yeah, thank you. I, so, I, was just, I just wanted to, to, to respond and say, I know in, amongst the, the, the crew of us that, that are involved with Active in Redbourne, we often have a conversation about how do we reach out to those parts of the community that somehow get forgotten, unintentionally neglected. So I, and I, I'm, I'm sensing that's, that's part of what you're trying to do as well, which is to stretch you, you know, the parts that Heineken reaches, to use that old expression. Absolutely. And there's no one answer to it, is there? Although we are a fairly small community, there's lots of strands to this. And part of it is working in collaboration and partnership with other groups. Yeah, yeah. You know, the community group isn't going to do everything by any means, but we need to all work together so that our kind of strong sense of community it remains that. And, and that's what we, sh we should be looking at, really. I think, anyway. Yeah, I could, couldn't agree more. And you and I could indulge yourselves by chatting this issue through for, for a lot longer than the time we have available. So, as always, thank you, Sally. That's very insightful, very wise, and, and paints a, a really nice picture for one of our most important community groups. So, thank you. Thank Mr. You. Emil. Yeah. Mr. Can I hand, hand over to you now, sir? Of course. I... It's top production. If... By any chance, you don't realise that the uh, 3rd of July is a big day for our village. It is the um, the fun day where we're all going to get on and have a lot of a party. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on it because I've got one of the uh, one of the contributors today and uh, uh, a man called Jez Cronshaw from the bowling club. And he has invented a new game, especially for the event. You don't do much better than that. Jez, I'm hoping you're there. Uh, I'm certainly here. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you, I can hear you perfectly. Excellent. Uh, well, good morning, Redborners. Just a, a quick update on uh, what we're going to be doing on July the 3rd. Um, obviously, I had to define something with a bowls theme, and it's quite difficult to set up a bowls rink at a drop of a hat on the common. So I thought I'd invent a simple game that can be played by two players between the ages of 3 to 93. So basically, anyone can play this. Um, we have a unique aspect to it, um, because it's a brand new game that's never been played before, and I invented it. It's called Target Pitonk. It's based on the French game of balls. So if you've ever been to provincial France on a Sunday morning, you'll see them all in the town square with a, a scrap of gravel and sets of balls, and they play pitonk. The slight difference here is that instead of a scrap of gravel, we've got a target. 
and the target has got score points on it. So instead of throwing the bulls at what is commonly known as a cochonet or a, a, a mini pig, you're actually throwing them towards a target. Uh, and you can see the score that you get where your little bulls land. We'll be recording the scores recorded as a scoring ladder, so it'll be a little bit like a squash ladder. Or for those of you who remember Top Gear, bless them, they had a, a fastest lap scorecard. So during the day, people will be coming up They'll be playing, taking a score, and we will be recording the highest score as we go through the day. Uh, tie decider will be the youngest player wins. That'll be about it, I think. Well, I, well, I mean, um, what a lot of people don't know is that Jez and I have actually test marketed this game. And I can tell you it's not as easy as it looks, but it is accessible. And he's rather good at it. But then again, with his... Um, bowling club background I'm, I'm, that's my excuse for the week just <laughs> tell us a little bit about the bowling club because I mean, it, it's not something we, we really talk about very much it'd be nice if you could uh, just give us a little bit of background about that because they're the guys that are providing this particular service fine well breadbourne bowls club was founded in 2005 we're based up beside the recreation center up dunstable road um, we've got a six rink all weather bowl surface so it's it's a carpet it's not quite astro turf it's just a carpet which makes it very easy and very fast to play we've got a total of about 55 to 60 members who regularly meet up and play once or twice a week um, we also play with against local teams from st albans berkhamstead harpenden um, and more importantly than that we tend to get together more than once a week on a social side as well. So we have um, evening events, we have quizzes that we run in the, in the uh, village hall for our members. So we're quite a sociable group. Uh, and we're always keen to have people who would like to come up and take advantage of, of just playing a few bowls with us. You used to have an open day. Is that something I suspect with, with lockdown has disappeared? Is it something you're gonna resurrect? Um, we may do. We tended to piggyback on the open day that the Recreation Centre organised, obviously because we're, we're right in the centre of the event there. Um, but while, rather than run our own individual open day, we just used to take part in the, the Recreation Centre activity. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, so in case anybody doesn't know, Jez, they'll be able to meet you and you're going to be there on the day, on the 3rd of July, giving target patonk lessons, I hope. Well, absolutely. In fact, you've only got to watch it for about three minutes and you'll get, the, you'll get the idea. It's the simplest possible version of the game that could have ever been invented. Because I'm a simple person, really. <laughs> simple is best, is what they say. Anyway, absolutely. excellent. I'll talk to you soon, Jess. Thank you very much. OK, come and join us. OK, cheers. And now I'm hoping, if I've got my notes right, we're going to go on to um, Redbourne Recommends. And, uh, Olive, I think you've got a Redbourne Recommends for us. Yeah, we've um, – let's uh, – first of all, I'd like to just say um, Kim put a note in the chat box here, and if people can't see that, and, of course, they won't on the recording, the contact centre number is 0800 316 9800. 0800 316 9800 and she says if there's any specific questions I'd be happy to provide answers to you thanks so much for inviting me on the call so let's just move on to um, first of all um, what's new and what's old on our doorstep we were thinking this morning Actually, we, we do what's new every week, but we don't talk much about what's already on our doorstep and that we've maybe even forgotten about, which is great segue in from what Jez was saying, that um, Bowles has been there for many, many years and we probably uh, rather take it for granted. So do take a look in the after lockdown brochure, which was has contributions from a lot of local groups short runs, children's activities, etc., and you'll all have received the after lockdown brochure through your letterbox. If by any chance you've lived too far out of the village that our distribution network hasn't managed to get to you, then just do let us know on 
info at active in Redborn. So, um, and we'll ensure that one's sent to you. Um, another thing I thought I'd just mention was we seem to have grown in the village a lot of four paved side cafes and they've grown up during lockdown and so we it's great to be able to enjoy those um, especially where the pav pavement is wide enough and also the lovely commons so those are a couple of things that I just thought I would remind you of then I was going to come on to June the 12th which is this Saturday yes um, Redbourne Village Market 10 o'clock in the morning till 2 p.m there's some interesting stalls including our own Simon Vegro has got his own bookstall there so do come along there's lots of new ones um, June the 15th uh, 7.30 Stephen Brooks is talking to he's doing an open Zoom talk to the Ver Valley Society that's another um, new thing um, and finally of course on July the 3rd as Chris was just and Jez were just talking about it's Redbourne's Fun Day so there's a few new things and a few old things to remember. And let's just move on to Redbourne Recommends. Um, we've had people recommending all sorts of things, books, recipes, um, cinema, films they've been to. And somebody was talking this week, but I haven't, we haven't managed to get that on Redbourne Recommends, about an open-air um, performance in St Albans, which sounds great. But anyway, we love to hear from fellow Redborners who have been reading and watching stuff lately. So do look at some of the previous recommendations. They're all up on the Facebook page. And this week, we have American by, I can't even pronounce the second thing. Would you like to have a go at that? Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Thank you. That's from my translation expert here. And it's recommended by Rachel. Hello, I'd like to recommend Americana by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. This book is, as most good books are, at its heart, a love story. But it is so much more than that. It's a powerful exploration of racial identity, society and life in Nigeria, the UK and the US. The story follows Ifemelu and Abinza, who are teenage sweethearts, but they go their separate ways when Ifemelu goes to start a new life at university in America and Abinza tries to make a life for himself in the UK. The majority of the book follows their respective experiences in the new countries and how important their social experiences are shaped by their race. The backdrop of whether the two will meet again is present throughout, but never straightforward. Ifemelu's first experience of thinking of herself as black is in the US and her struggle both to fit in with the new world whilst also preserve her cultural heritage, is stark. Much of the book is a very direct, honest and funny look at some of the circumstances in which she finds herself. If Emily makes her money, ultimately, in the US as a blogger, the blog extracts allow her voice to allow her to voice over her attitudes and opinions alongside the story's narrative. This works really well. Important events in the US history, such as Obama's election as president, occur during the narrative. They provide a wonderful backdrop for much of her racial discussion. The book is also incredibly moving in parts. The description of how every white child in the class at school was given sun cream to put on, other than her cousin, the one black child in his class, who was told he didn't need sun cream, moved me to tears. He was born in the US and he expected to fit in. She uses hair as a powerful visual representation of her struggles with identity, wearing her hair naturally versus relaxing it, especially when she feels the need to fit in at a large corporation when going for a job interview. This book is powerful, thought-provoking and involving. It is not an easy read or something you can read a few pages of before bed. This is one for when you have decent amounts of time to sit down and absorb it, which I would recommend everyone does. That was great. Thank you, Rachel. I mean, I think uh, many people will be inspired to try reading that. Um, if you've enjoyed these recommendations and you'd like to voice one recommendation yourself, that would be absolutely great. It's really easy. All you need to do is record a little audio on your um, phone and send it to Rachel and Rachel will 
um, make the vid make it into a video for you. So please send any voice recordings to info at activingredbourne.co.uk. And thank you so much for that one, Rachel. Chris, I think it's over to you for some closing thoughts as we sit on either end of our virtual settee this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I have to say, um, today has been a very, very, well, informative as always, but very, very thought-provoking. And Will, your thoughts were brilliant. I didn't, I didn't think... Um, I was in the camp of, of letting be as a kid. Um, you put it into context for me, and for that, I'm very thankful. So, on that note of a lovely sunny day, back from our holidays and only three weeks away from being able to go meet up again socially, I hope you have a lovely day and hope to see all of you and Ivan and Simon and Olive next week. Cheers, then. Thanks, all. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.